All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Behind the Curtain. I'm Carly. I'm going to be our moderator for today. Hopefully, you've already had a chance to watch our production of the pitch. But if you haven't, it will be available today until probably about an hour or so after this chat is over. Uh, below this video, you will see our chat room where you can submit any questions or comments you have for Danny, Stan, or John. And if this program is something that you really value, please consider making a donation to support the Majestic Theater and support other future programs like Behind the Curtain. And you can also email any feedback you have to info at majestictheater.com. And I would like to welcome Danny, John, and Stan from The Pitch. Um, the, our children's theater productions of, of The Jungle Book um, is, is still running. It's still available to you via our website. Um, uh, and The Jungle Book is running right now. Sleepy Hollow is still available uh, through our website. And uh, next week for Behind the Curtain at the Majestic, uh, my guest is uh, J.T. Waite, one of uh, one of our actors. He's been in oh any number of shows at the Majestic. You will recognize him. Uh, so it'd be great to talk to J.T. And here's uh, an important thing for you people: watch your mailboxes because uh, come probably Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're going to be getting uh, a really exciting and important piece of mail from uh, all of us here at the Majestic. Okay, so, hey Stan, hey John, how are you today? Good. Hey Danny, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. Great. All things considered. <laughs> um, so Stan, all right, let's jump right into this. Uh, you know, I know a number of people uh, who, who did see the show before we had to close it down in the middle of the run. You know, they would uh, come up the ramp at the end of the evening and and many, many of them have asked, well, is this a true story? I mean, this is really cool. Is it a true story? How did you, how did this play originate? Um, well, I got interested in uh, writing fiction in my twenties. Uh, I had a couple of short stories published in small magazines, but knew by the time I was 30, I was gonna make a career of this. So I got in the newspapers, uh, ended up at the paper in Springfield for 28 years, but still had a little interest in writing fiction. And I think in the late 90s one night, I was uh, reading the paper after deadline and a, there was an obituary in there of a local guy who had uh, played a couple of seasons of minor league ball then come back to Springfield, worked in the mills the rest of his uh, life. And, uh, so, and he died. And um, so I thought that might make an interesting story. So I wrote this story about two sports writers who were working on a biography of this obscure player. And uh, they would argue all the time. So ten, I didn't do anything with it, it sat in a drawer. 10 years went by, in 2010, the paper was rapidly losing circulation, people getting laid off. And um, I was looking for something else to do. So I found this short story, I thought it might make a good screenplay. I sent it to a whole bunch of producers whose emails I found online. And uh, I only got one response, it was from a producer in New York named uh, Norman Twain. And he thought that it would not make a great screenplay, but he thought it would make a good stage play, that there were a lot of uh, good uh, older actors that would love to play the part of the retired sports writer in this. And um, so uh, he said, go ahead and write it and then send me what you got. So I did, he liked the play and, uh, and, immediately, and optioned it and immediately got interest from uh, Brian Dennehy, who's a, an actor who died about a month ago, I think. And he yeah. was a two-time Tony Award winner. He starred in lots of movies. Been, you know, you, you would know him if you saw him. If you Google him, you'd know who he was. And he was interested in the role. And we ended up having a couple of readings in New York with, with Brian. And there were closed readings, no audience, just uh, the producer, uh, agents, uh, potential investors, uh, things like that. And um, nothing came of this, but for whatever reason. And I got the play back eventually, it went into a drawer. And then uh, around 2017, 2018, I rewrote it, uh, I think significantly improved it. And um, I showed it to a friend who knew John, John Haig, and he sent it to John Haig and John Haig contacted me and was um, immediately enthusiastic about it. And he urged me to have a uh, public reading of this. No audience had ever heard it to that point. And he also, <clears throat> he also urged me to, to send it to Danny. 
and both of which I did. We, we had the reading in the basement uh, community room of the um, Forbes Library in uh, Northampton. I put one little item in the Gazette about it. And um, we, I, you know, I expected maybe 15, 20 people to show up. Well, we had an overflow crowd. We were only allowed to have 50 in there. And they just loved the play. And when it was over, we had a talk back with the cast and myself and not a single person left and comment after comment was how much they enjoyed the play and they hoped to see it produced and so forth. And then about the same time, uh, Danny uh, made the offer, uh, very unusual to take, you know, a play that uh, by a local playwright who'd never written a play before and make it part of his main stage season, which was just unprecedented, I think. And um, that's how we got here today. Uh, you know, it's a, a funny story that people may appreciate this. Um, you know, when I first uh, got the script and I, 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 was, I was unable to attend the reading. Um, you had a play, why, but I was unable to. You had a play debut. Yeah. Script. yeah. And, and, and I really loved the script and I wanted to, uh, to schedule it for, um, this, this was all last year, you know wanted to schedule it for our season this year. And I remember uh, calling you up and, and, and saying, well, geez, I, you know, I really love the play and you know, I wanna schedule it and it'll be our uh, fourth production of the season, um, which opens in March. And, and your reaction was, geez, that's like, a, that's like a year away. I don't know if I can wait that long. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I was pretty stupid. Let me say that. Are you shooting me down? And, you know, and uh, so I started looking for another play. And then, I don't know, the next day or two days later, you caught back and, you know, I had, bre I had breakfast with John Haig and he said, yeah, right. Right. call him back and uh, accept it. We'll wait a year. I don't mind that. So yeah, I said, Stan, Stan, no, 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 Stan. Just like, it's all, it's all good, Stan. Let's not say anything. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Uh, man. Um, so I might as well ask the question that we that actors always get asked um, and that has to do with lines and you know John for for especially for this show you had a pretty a pretty major line load there you know um, did you struggle at all learning your lines and what's your process uh, for that Actually, surprisingly, no, um, and that's not always been the case. So, of course, one of the things for me was the quality of the writing. You know, it was it was tightly constructed. There's an internal logic in it that's it's it works because it's uh, it's quality writing. So that made it easier. Um, Another thing was uh, being on stage all the time turned out surprisingly for me to be a real boon because, you know, once I was able to just embrace that reality and decide, okay, um, I'm going to live in the moment and, and concentrate as, consistent, as consistently as I could, um, it kind of expedited the process, made it made it go more smoothly for me. Uh, I guess you know you remove resistance, and then all of a sudden things start to happen, you know. But uh, the approach I take is I don't I don't look at lines as I don't I'm not memorizing anything. I don't memorize lines, you know. That's just words to me. Although the words are very important, uh, it's not really about the words per se. Uh, to me, every line is a response to a previous either action or, or, or a line, uh, which means um, I really have to look at, first of all, my partner's lines. So I spend most of the time, and I spent about two months constantly reading the script, and, but I was studying my partner's lines or the scene partner's lines and taking a close look at words and phrases that really trigger responses. So I guess uh, make a long story short, what I was really studying was character motivation and action. If, if these, these lines are responses to some kind of stimulus, I kind of see them as actions. 
Yeah, yeah. Instead of, instead of just, I'm saying words, which of course for me is very difficult to remember. So, um, you know, um, I think the French word for rehearsal is repetition, you know, repetition. Uh, but it doesn't mean rote repetition. It means um, that the rehearsal period, uh, you know, if you really do the preparation properly, the rehearsal period allows you to, uh, the lines just arrive. If you can let go of, first of all, a certain measure of control. I mean, that's the thing that's exciting about acting to me. Uh, I, I see myself as flying blind a little bit. So if I'm listening and I'm present moment by moment, they're gonna be there if I've done the preparation. And so that's worked for me, you know, especially with this particular play. I mean, I, I salute Stan for, uh, I mean, the writing really is, it's, yeah, it really is great writing. And, and I think things like, um, you know, speaking as the director now, um, you know, I think the, the, the lines and, and all those responses that you're talking about uh, just kind of slid into place um, or organically from pretty much from day one, from the beginning of, of the rehearsal process. You know, so uh, for, for me as a director, I would say this was like a really easy show in, a, in that sense, yeah. you know? Yeah, in some ways it was, no question about it. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, how, uh, had you known Julian before uh, before the reading? Now, Julian is, is one of the other actors in the play. He's who's the young sports writer for you folks who are just tuning in. I, I'd never, I'd never met him. I think uh, Stan, you, you introduced me to Julian, right? Uh, a mutual friend. We were looking for the young sports writer, and a mutual friend suggested Julian. We contacted him. He read it, and he took part in the original reading. And you know, you both ended up at the Majestic, which was, you know, mm. great because you were both terrific in that. Thanks. Yeah, there's a nice picture. The two of you, Julian, right. fixing your typewriter room. <laughs> you can see he's very happy about the whole prospect of fixing my typewriter room. <laughs> yeah, did you um, did you notice did you notice a uh, a difference like in in well we always say this the audience is different every night right so uh, you get different. Uh, different reactions, different responses from the audience, you know, and, and in those days when, uh, did we get into doubles? Maybe one couple of times. Yeah. A couple of times we got into a double yeah. show, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, when there were a number of young people in the audience, I didn't get as many laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we had a lot of fun. First of all, you know, we really bonded with this. And, I, and we could feel that we had something special going on right from the stage reading. So we were all excited right from the start. So that's a good way to, to bond, you know, around yeah. something really exciting. Um, but, you know, there were nights when most of the audience, you know, I mean, everybody knows that it's old people like, like me who go to the theater, not so, the 20 somethings aren't going to the theater nearly as much. And, um, you know, the, the audience would laugh at all my, my jokes, you know, at his expense, you know, like about technology, stuff right, about right. that, the cell phone, you know. God, that, that yeah, hurt really, me. Uh, you know? really funny video <laughs> making rounds on, on the internet about some, 20 somethings get getting handed a rotary dial phone <laughs> and, and and asked to make a phone call you right. know and right. forget it the, yeah yeah so he, he asks me you know you you maybe you're in a like a, a whatever a, you know out someplace at a at a you know Lowe's or something and you know and that's foreign to this guy I'm playing because uh, he's got one phone and that's it. And, and you know, 
he's talking to it. So it's very funny stuff. But um, I, we come back after the show was over and I tell him, well, it looks like they were on my side tonight. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we had a lot of fun, Julian and I. And then we bonded through the characters too. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, in spite of all the differences, and there were a ton of them, I mean, we're on opposite sides of, you know, the spectrum of life. I'm in my 70s, and he's what? Uh, 28. Yeah. 28, something like that. Um, I, I immediately felt, you know, a real, uh, I was drawn to him because it occurred to me that he was going down the same messed up road that I did. So he was making the same mistakes that I'd made in my life. When I say I, of course, I mean Roger. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I realized, and he tries to help him a lot, you know, sort of like kind of in a ham-handed way, but uh, that was very moving to me. And we both realized there was a kind of like father-son thing going on. So, and again, a great tribute to Stan's talent as a writer, you know, when that bond is broken, it, there's, a, there's a kind of a tragic feel to it, you know, because the thing that works about the play is that there's love between the two of them. Yeah. And Julian and I felt that palpably. So it's a very rare thing that I've experienced. This has been a real gift for me. You know, one thing about this that was very uh, strange is that uh, John had a lot in common with his character. And Ju Julian's character was 28, Harvard educated, grew up very poor. And uh, Julian actually, he was Harvard educated, grew up in Franklin County, you know, not well off. And uh, they had a lot in common. So they, I think they just, grabbed onto these characters more deeply than and other actors would have. Yeah, and I, I went to Brooklyn College because it was the only place I could afford. So, I mean, it was a, the whole, you know, class thing that was going on. I had a lot of fun with that, you know, like, you know, pushing his buttons about Harvard, you know, Andover. You know, Even in personality, John had a lot in common with uh, Roger Pinnell, the character he plays, you know. Roger is a uh, down-to-earth, blue-collar, kind of cynical guy, but with, a, you know, a real artistic street. I mean, is it, Roger in the play is a really good writer, and John, good actor. And they had a lot in common that way. And I think Julian, uh, if you question him about it, will say he had a lot in common with the character, Mike Resnick, who he plays. Yeah. So... Well, maybe that's why I was a Mets fan all my life and before them, the Dodgers, you know, in Brooklyn, because, you know, hey, dem bums. So that's what right. do you expect? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Stan, so, um, you know, you're, how closely or how, how parallel to your sort of mind's eye vision uh, of your script before it went into production of your play before it went into production and then seeing it, it live uh, you know did yeah how did they uh how did they fit well when i was writing it not having a big uh you know background in the theater so I, you know i didn't have a lot of opinions about how things should be done i just focused on the writing and trying to make the script itself as you know dramatic as it could be as amusing as it could be in some places and so forth and uh, I was expect expecting that the director and the actors would work out how it was actually staged. And I, you know, remember the first time I saw this, uh, you know, I came to some of the re rehearsals in the beginning yeah. and to the first time you were actually on the stage and doing a complete run through. And I saw the decisions, Danny, that you'd made about, you know, how to do the memory scenes, the lighting, uh, where the actors were. And I just thought they were terrific. And I never could have like, uh, thought those up myself prior to this. So, um, you know, especially the, the scene where um, Steve Pierce, who was terrific, and Katie Sloan, very good, uh, they are recalling a, an event and John stays on stage and has his hands over his head and he, he speaks his part from, the, from his seat on stage. 
And they, as John is speaking, they're looking out into the audience where he's supposed to be. And uh, it, wor it worked perfectly. I, I didn't explain it that well. You can't really visualize it, but if you saw the play, that yeah, that's the scene. Except John is sitting down as he speaks, speaks his lines, and uh, it just like was a great choice. So I hat off to you. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a memory scene that that's uh, for John that's happening, and but we the audience get to see it live. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Did uh, you know? I know you've had. Stan, some film experience. I mean, because uh, uh, you wrote this film, The God Question, and you got very involved in producing that, right? As well, you know. And I, th I think, um, I don't know. Would you ever rethink this piece uh, in terms of of film? Um, Even well, though that so original producer discouraged that. Yeah. No. No. I, I actually wrote it. Uh, as a screenplay also, but my experience with, uh, I, I wrote and produced and basically funded a very inexpensive uh, uh, independent film. And it used a lot of the actors in the Valley here, uh, local location, locations in the Valley. A lot of actors had been through the Majestic. And um, it was a disappointing experience. Even though we got into like 10 film festivals, we won some awards in film festivals, we got picked up by a distributor, which was very unusual for uh, such an inexpensive film, uh, we haven't yet made back the costs on it, or I haven't made back the costs on it. And, uh, but it was very, the thing about a play is first, I don't have to put my money into it, you know, and that's, that was good. And, uh, but secondly, you go, you're sitting in a play and you see the audiences watching it. Uh, people, with a movie, you you know, it's playing some other place. You don't have an interaction with the audience. It's a much more satisfying situation to be a playwright than it is to be a screenwriter or even a newspaper reporter. You just don't have the connection to the audience that you do with a, uh, with a play. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about that the other day. And yeah, um, same for me. I mean, it's what got me started writing plays as opposed to uh, fi short fiction, which I'd been doing a lot of when I, first started to think of myself as a writer. Yeah, you, you told me that story about a professor of yours who, a professor of yours who's always came down on you for making that switch. But my feeling was, wow, you did the right thing. Yeah, maybe so, who knows? Yeah. Um, so now I know, I know there's a, well, there was at least kind of a tour uh, in the planning stages uh, after the Majestic run, where, how, where do things stand with that right now? Well, I've contact, we had uh, four theaters in Southern New England that we were gonna be doing after this run. We, in fact, the first uh, May 8th and 9th were our first scheduled week, uh, weekend, but uh, they, you know, they understood why we had to cancel out, but I've contacted a couple of them and they're very happy to have us back when all this ends. So that. Once the Majestic Runs uh, takes place, if it does again, we'll uh, be, we'll try to uh, restart that tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, good. Let's see if it, you know, goes somewhere else. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, what, Stan, what were, uh, so what were some of your favorite moments uh, when you were watching uh, the show. I mean, you talked about that one scene with uh, Steve and Katie, and and uh, you know that flashback scene where. Uh, well, I was. I thought the humor in that Julian and John got out of the script in the first opening scene was, was you know, I always liked that, and the, the way they played that really got uh, got the last word. But the most dramatic scene in the whole play was uh, Steve Pierce as the pitcher, and he and John. Uh, meeting outside the locker room. Yeah. And, uh, when I'd written the script, I knew that, you know, that was going to be the important scene in the whole play. And uh, Steve was just terrific. And uh, John, in that scene, when you watch it, it, it just was, has a, a real impact. And there were actually nights when, when the climax came that um, people in the audience would gasp. And I thought that was like a, a testament to how well they acted that scene. 
Yeah, there's a picture up right now. And right. For you folks who are watching, again, this is sort of a, you know, you might think of it in terms of a split screen, you know, uh, John's character is in, in the apartment and kind of reliving this phone call. And we actually see the phone call with, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Steve, who, who plays uh, uh, the pitcher, uh, Vern Peters. Um, Should have John Hague uh, tell that story about Steve, uh, who had never played baseball, played other sports, but not baseball. And uh, he um, was told two weeks before opening night that he was going to have, and he was a right-hander. Yeah, he was a right-hander. He was going to be a lefty. He was going to have to throw the left the pitch as a left-hander. And uh, John, you tell us, tell the rest of that. Well, I came in with uh, with video. Of, I mean, it's it's a testament to how this cast was such a tightly knit group. We really wanted to help each other through thick and thin. There was a real ensemble, and you know that becomes a cliche after a while. But it's just everybody was all in to make this work and to make it a success. And and there were a, there, there wasn't a weak link there. I mean, all really good actors. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, <laughs> you know I, I saw that he wasn't a natural lefty. So I came in with video of uh, Clayton Kershaw warming up. Right. You know, and you could watch, you know, you could slow mo it so you could see all the mechanics in his, you know, from the time he wound up to the time he delivered the pitch. And it was, it was kind of fascinating to me to see all those mechanics at work. Uh, so much of it is is just coming up from the ground. I mean, Seaver had that capacity too to just, he wasn't throwing from the shoulder, he was throwing from the root, you know, from the ground yeah. up. But two yeah. weeks before opening night, uh, when Steve first began practicing this, we went out into a back room and he just showed us the motion he had. and. You know, yeah. John had the same reaction. This is going to be just a, uh, you know, a disaster. <laughs> and, uh, he kept working on it. And strangely enough, on by opening night, he looked like a left-handed, you know, fastball. It right. Yeah, it was great. You no, know, you know, you know, there he is. There's right there. a word from anyone who said that wasn't authentic. It, it just looked terrific. Yeah. So. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. You yeah. know. Yeah. Well, he was, you know, he, every, every night at rehearsal, uh, before every performance, he was he was practicing uh, yeah. that that move, that pitch. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's a hard work. Sure. And his reaction, he his reaction to it. You know, for for people who don't uh, who don't really know the story, you know, the Roger and and uh, John's character and Vernon Peters, the pitcher, were best friends. They went to high school together. Um, back in the day and and uh you know Vern Peters finally makes it to uh to Yankee Stadium and he gets put in in the sixth inning um with the uh with the with the Yankees uh what hanging on to a one run lead or something I forget. Yeah he, he tried you know and Carl is this Boston which was great. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, they're playing the Red Sox, and and Carl Yastrzemski is up up to bat, and uh, um, so he throws one pitch. Yastrzemski uh, hits it, runs out all the way out to the wall. A bunch of runners score, and you know uh, Ralph Hauk, who was the Yankee manager at the time, uh, yanks him, and so his career in the major leagues was one pitch. And uh, so of course the audience cheered, <laughs> you know, when he when the you, you hear the crack of the bat. I love it. Right, right. The audience just loved that. Our uh, Massachusetts like audience. Boston, right. You know? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, that was fun. It was great. Um uh Freddie, Fred, Freddie. You now we should talk a little bit about that. Carly, are you uh you on here? <laughs> We got a Fred pitcher. Oh, uh, I guess I am. <laughs> oh, God, is that Yankee gal? <laughs> so, so Carly, uh, you know, was the, the production assistant backstage uh, for 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 the pitch. And um, in the script, there's one little scene between uh, Roger and uh, somebody from the Yankee organization called Fred. 
you know, and, uh, you know, I think Fred has how many lines, Carly? Is it five lines? All right? three. <laughs> three lines. <laughs> and, and so um, me as a producer and a director, uh, it's just like made no sense to bring, uh, bring an actor in for, you know, two minutes on, on stage. And uh, I think maybe Stan, we did we talk ever talk about cutting that scene at all or reworking that scene? Well, I, think I think you just asked me, would you care if it's a male or female? I said, no, you just got to rename her, but they didn't rename her. <laughs> well, Freddie. Yeah, it became Freddie, which is cool. So, cool. so Carly's backstage, and I said, well, you know, damn it, I'm just going to bring Carly out and you know put her in a costume, and and you know she'll be like a secretary for. <laughs> for the Yankees or something. And there she is. Did a good job too. And she's got a pencil behind tucked in her ear, which I love. <laughs> That's directing 101. Right. <laughs> get, get a pencil and stick it in your ear. Oh man. Uh, I have to say, you know, being a stagehand and having the opportunity to do this, I have a much greater appreciation for you actors, I will never nag on you guys for missing a line ever again. You know, I had three, it was terrifying. Yeah, we were all crazy, of course, you know. <laughs> you know, I thought it was such a breath of fresh air, you know, if I may say so. It was, you know, there's so much stereotyping around uh, sports in general, you know, I mean, uh, and particularly around gender roles. Uh, so it was great, you know, having not the Yankees press guy, but the Yankees press gal, you know, and uh, they have this young woman instead of some grizzled old guy like me, you know, chomping on a cigar or something like that, you know. I mean, I, I thought it was just great, you know, it kind of balanced things out for me a little bit. And yeah, I could have come out with a cigar instead of a pencil. That would have been a choice. <laughs> geez, I'm glad I didn't suggest it. <laughs> um, you know, as long as I'm here, I do have a question from the audience. Um, Shoot. They want to know about any um, good stories from backstage, anything that we didn't see. What's the question? About anything that happened backstage. Is there anything that we didn't see that you would want to share? Oh, you mean like bloopers or? Uh... Right. <laughs> How about it, guys? John, anything uh, anything go on backstage? <laughs> Top to mind immediately was the costume changes. <laughs> which we were all freaked about. Julian and I were so how are we going to do this, you know, and Carly and, uh, and Katie, Katie just yeah. failed us out immensely. I mean, that's another thing about the, how the group worked so well together. Everybody pitched in to help. And uh, they both, you know, somehow got us out of one costume into another in like the space of about 10 seconds. It was crazy. Uh, which I thought was going to be impossible when I first, you know, thought about it. So that was that was kind of hair raising, but a lot of fun too. You know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there look at is. there's the lovely Katie Sloan. Such a good <laughs> actor too, really. Yeah. Uh, one reviewer mentioned about Katie that she uh, went from being a 70 year old to a 20 year old in the space of like three four minutes, I think. Yeah, yeah, right. And did a good job at both ends of that. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. So did, um, were, were, were there any um, unforeseen things that happened uh, on stage, John, in performance that? You know, I mean, there, you know, I think there were a few rough spots in the preview, <laughs> you know, um, and uh, around lines, you know, but the thing that uh, it was, it was, you know, the thing was when you're working with actors that are as good as these, these three were, you know, uh, um, they cover, you know, I mean, you know, you, you, you can relax because, and we were all, we all made that explicit with each other. Just don't worry about it. You know, I'm going to be there. Right, necessary. So I remember there were a couple of incidents where, uh, uh, you know, I, I you know, I, I reinvented that whole last section of the play, and probably nobody had any idea, but I'd lost my way <laughs> through that one. Are you talking about the very last scene where Julian comes back? And the, yeah. some like looks. Like, 
about that. I had some surprised looks on the part of Julian, but he covered beautifully. Another, another time I remember, I think it was the, the rehearsal and one of the preview performances where Julian, you know, uh, <laughs> kind of skipped over a few pages. So I just sort of like brought him back to where we were. And it was a stroke of luck. But those things are going to happen. Once we opened, I thought we, uh, yeah, I thought we were fine. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't see any major bloopers after that, although I may have buried the memory of it. But I don't yeah, think so. No, I don't know. There weren't. But, you know, there, there were a couple instances when uh, Julian bailed you out a little bit. And there, yeah. there was a couple instances when you, uh, you know, you covered for Julian. Totally. And of course, the audience doesn't really pick yeah. up on that at all. You know, well, That's what makes it exciting. It's live. You know, you know, guys were saying a little while ago, you know, nothing like theater. I really appreciated what you two were saying about how live theater was so much more fun for both of you. You know, one thing I, I noticed uh, that when you go to a play, you usually go to play only once. So you don't see it evolve through the uh, performances. But, uh, you know, I was there opening night and I think I came three or four other times, maybe four or five other times till it closed uh, two weeks later. And I noticed that uh, the actors be sensed what the audience reacted to strongly and they, you know, they in embellish what they were doing to make it an even stronger reaction. Like Julian, he found humor in a line that I never thought was funny. I wrote it and it was not. He said it was something line like uh, his life was a nightmare. He, you know, uh, his son overdosed. This he's talking about the pitcher. Uh, he was homeless. He was, uh, you know, had a stroke mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And then he turns to the audience and says, "What a great story of unfulfilled dreams!" And the audience just erupts in laughter once he started doing it that that way. And I know John and Julian both. Uh, I would see changes in their performance as time went on to take advantage of what showed up in the script as, you know, uh, to get a strong re reaction from the audience. And that must be a very common thing in theater that evolves as, as it goes along. Yeah, it's those, those uh, nuances that, um, that actors learn from the audience, actually. I mean, I've yeah. always maintained that the audience is the great teacher. Well, I remember Kate mentioning last week how, uh, you know, she began to understand parts of the play that she didn't hadn't understood before. And I think we all go through this from the audience as, mm -hmm. as the run of one of her plays went along. And uh, that was true of, of us, too. I mean, the audience taught us a lot about the scenes that we we might have been going down the wrong road uh, uh, once or twice there, uh, or maybe we missed an important aspect of the scene, like particularly with the vulnerability of these two guys. When that came out, uh, or when the audience would surprise us with reactions we didn't expect, those were really learning learning moments for us, you know, and, and that's actually helped us develop uh, more depth with what we were doing, I think, you know. Yeah, Danny, let, let me ask you a question. Yeah. You know, one time playwright, and you know, I, I learned a lot through this play about, uh, you know, about writing. You've well, been you have another script, right? Well, I do, yeah. And yeah. That, that's actually improved since you've seen it, but anyway, but you've been doing this for a long, long time as a playwright and as a, you know, the director and so forth. What have you learned like from about audiences in all that time? What did you start out thinking about audiences and what understanding do you have about audiences these days? <clears throat> well, number one, I think um, the audience is always, you know, this is both from a writer's point of view, but, but also from a producer's point of view. Um, you know, the audiences are always, I think, on your side, if that makes sense. Um, so as an example, I, I, I'll use this because I've used this often. Um, let's say we were doing a production of Hamlet 
at the majestic stage, which we actually did, I don't know, several years ago. Um, but basically we tell the audience, okay, um, here you are, we're at a castle um, uh, called Elsinore in Denmark, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the audience knows, the actors all know, you know, that it's a scenery, it's wood, it's flats, it's styrofoam, it's that's been right. painted. Now, but the audience says, oh, okay, I'll go along with that. Right. You know, they are, they're, they're completely, um, they're completely accepting of it. And the, I think the only, the only kind of danger is if somehow you waste their time. Uh -huh. It's yeah. not even a question of how much they pay for a ticket to come see a show. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's a, that's a moot point. If you waste their time, yeah. So, um, yeah, how you does that? They called it a pact last week, and I, I like that idea. Oh, sure. Or yeah. a compact, yeah. Yeah, it's a yeah. compact. With yeah. the audience, yeah, for sure. So, I think uh, um, for me, hopefully, all these years I've learned don't waste their damn time. Right. What have you figured out is a waste of time for them? What do they not like that, you know, you might have thought early in your career they would like, but you've learned that it just doesn't work? Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's always, you know, ever since I was a child, a young child, um, I always imagined myself as a storyteller. And I kind of got that from my dad, who was a great storyteller. Um, and... I, so I consider myself now to this day a storyteller. So, uh, but I just happen to tell stories on stage in, in front of an audience, you know, rather than in a book um, or, or on a page. And uh, whether, whether I've written a play and it's being produced or I'm directing your play, we're, you know, we're telling a story. And um, it's, uh, you know, the characters in, in the story want to be, I think, accessible, uh, and, and identifiable to the audience. And, uh, if you're able to do that, I think you're, you have a success. You're successful. Yeah. I studied with a guy in New York once, Mel Shapiro, who, who, who uh, he made the point in one of the classes I've never forgotten. There was a guy who was like kind of complaining. He didn't really feel like doing the work. And Mel said, it's not about you. Your job is to give the audience a gift of yourself. And that means to, you know, you know forget about all the stuff that's going on in your personal life. And when that curtain opens, completely, completely commit to that illusion, that that part of the pact that we all agree on that makes this so magical. And that's our job as actors. And I, I think that 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 for me was a important, you know, thing to because, you know, so much of the way people perceive actors is oh, we were all full of ourselves and all this. And yeah. I, think, I think frankly, it's, it's, it's the opposite. I think our job is to divest ourselves of all of our personal stuff and turn it over into the, to, to serve the story, as you call it, which it is exactly what it is and serve the character and make, give the audience, you know, a, a, a wonderful show for their hard-earned money. And I, that's a very important thing for me to remember, you know, well, when I do this work. <laughs> this is a little esoteric, but, you know, I'm wondering if there isn't um, some sort of anthropological kind of connection to, uh, to, to storytelling. Because, you know, I mean, if you think back to the days of, 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 early humans, right? Uh, they were telling stories in yeah. 
some fashion or another through through song or writings on a wall or you know passing stories down to their to their children and and in a sense this is kind of a a continuation of, of of that you know so kind of a necessary human endeavor it's very much a part of our wire no question about it you know we, we're storytellers by nature yeah 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 how, and how, how we learn about things you know i know when i whenever i do a playwriting workshop you know especially for 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 newer playwrights new playwrights you know there's that sort of adage from um from people who talk about writing that you should write what you know yeah and <clears throat> you know I, I tell people in my playwriting courses well forget that write what you don't know you know go learn about something and, and write about what you don't know it, it, you know it's it's much more enriching in your life it's too easy in a sense to try and write about what you do know but it's plus what when you write about what you do know you take for granted that everybody else who's like reading this or looking at this or listening to this has knows the same thing that you you know and that's not true you know so yeah carly you got some questions just you know going off of that topic we had a great question from the audience uh lucy and dwight it's for you stan uh how did you give birth to this story was there something in your life that inspired you or really going off of that just something that inspired you to switch from writing for the paper to writing for the stage i think dwight who worked at the paper when i did also was an editor there uh he probably missed oh, the, really? this, the explanation at the beginning which is that it did begin at the paper i saw an obituary in the paper one night back in the 90s, I think, of a guy, local guy who had um, played a couple of minor league seasons and came back to Springfield, worked in the local mills and had died. And that uh, created the, um, the idea for this. I wrote it as a short story. I'll repeat, I'm just repeating this, you know, for Dwight here. Uh, wrote a short story, 2010, I sent it out to uh, various producers and one producer in New York said it would, might, might make a good play and that's what started started it off as a play. Well, very cool. All right, we have one more here uh, for John. Uh, let's see, Lucy and Dwight, again, <laughs> they're very excited about our show today. Uh, they asked about doing doubles. So as in, you know, we have a matinee and then an evening pour, evening report the same day. Is there anything that you do to keep your energy up in between shows? Well, once I've done one show, I'm energized, you know, that's, uh, so it's not all that difficult for me to do that. Uh, you know, I feel like uh, it's kind of that first show, although I don't like to look at it as I'm warming up for the second one, you know, you're, you're just, you are completely warmed up and ready to go for the second one. Uh, you have to do the same prep right before the show starts, but I, I find uh, it's difficult. It's a lot of work for sure, but on the other hand, you, you, you really, at least I am, I should speak for myself, uh, I'm really on the top of my game in that second one, you know, uh, because, you know, you've already been through one show already just hours before. So um, I, I don't find it as difficult as some other people do. Um, uh, because, uh, as I say, it, it, it just energizes me, you know, it really energizes me. I can't just mail it in, though. I, I got to be, I got to be there in order to make that happen. Yeah, I've always, I've always enjoyed the, the second show on a double show day. Because um, I, I, I find them, uh, those second shows, a little more interestingly nuanced. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't know if because, you know, you've been, you know, the cast has been through uh, the entire show once already, but they're maybe yeah. just a little bit tired or a little bit more relaxed. Uh, I think that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, I think we're more relaxed. 
you yeah. know and when we're more relaxed the work is always more nuanced always more interesting so relaxation is that's why relaxation is always a goal you know because you got to get rid of all that stuff that's in the way in order to you know really fully i guess be as expressive as you can be right right uh let's see how are we doing emily uh carly rather okay. unless you have any final questions here for john and stan we are unfortunately out of time i don't know if you have any final thoughts danny uh i'm good right now you guys got anything you want to add to this uh i've, I've enjoyed it immensely yep. it's a lot of fun really thanks for the opportunity yep yeah so, you know, this behind the curtain with uh, Stan and John will be on our website. Uh, so, you know, people can go back and, and visit that. And um, let's see, our next uh, behind the curtains is next week at two o'clock uh, with, again, with uh, my friend John J.T. Waite. We'll be talking about the Fantastics, uh, who had a con connection with the Fantastics in New York for decades and um so thank you all for uh, tuning in and stay safe stay healthy and we'll see you in a week thank you stan thank you john and carly yeah thank you yeah. Danny. <laughs> thank nice you everyone stuff. take care stan yep yeah.